Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining me for our first ever video only Wednesday night Bible study. Now, you might be looking at me right now and thinking, what is this fool doing in a full suit on a Wednesday when he's the only one at church? Well, short answer for that is I'm trying to look like a lawyer. That'll make a little more sense here in just a little while. See, guys, I've been extra stressed here lately with all this virus and who's going to get sick and who's not going to get sick. And do we have church? Do we not have church? Perhaps you've been feeling a little bit of that same extra apprehension here lately. And I thought for my own sanity, I need to lighten things up a little bit. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'm going to have a little bit of fun tonight, and I think you might enjoy it too. Let me lead into uh, to what I'm doing here. Um. You see, sneaking up ever closer behind all this virus news is Easter. It's right around the corner. Easter, of course, is the pinnacle holiday for us as Christians. So I'd like to start swinging some focus back that way in the next few days. Now, of course, before Jesus' resurrection uh, was his death on the cross. While it's sad and hard for us to think about uh, the cruel, awful death that he suffered, it's great for us that he did. While many in the secular world attempt to discredit the resurrection of Jesus, it's generally not argued that he did exist and that he was put to death on the cross. Quick Google search will show you that there are conflicting views as to whose fault this was. Many blame the Jews for Jesus' death. Others claim it was not the Jews' fault, it was the Romans. So today, I invite you to step into the courtroom, examine the evidence and the testimony of an expert witness, and to settle once and for all who is to blame for the murder of Jesus Christ. Let's go to court now. All right, thanks for joining me here in the courtroom. As you can see, Judge Judy's here to make sure everything's done by legal standards. Please excuse the, uh, the construction going on in here. We are renovating. By the way, that's going well. This is a Bible study, by the way, so if you want to look in your Bibles with me as we go, uh, we'll be in Matthew chapter 27 here in just a few minutes. <clears throat> now, all of our first-hand accounts will come from the expert witness of the written Word of God. Sorry about that. I forgot my witness prompter. I could edit that out, but for some reason it seems like it would be funner just to leave it in. So all of our uh, accounts and expert witness will be coming from the Word of God. Every Christian believer should know that the Bible is 100% true, and we should trust everything it says. So with that, Mr. Bible, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And of course, he will. And can we see some verses to confirm that? Let's refer to Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And John 17, 17, the words of Jesus Christ. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we can trust our Bible, the word of God, to give us the true account of what really happened. Well, the first thing that we need to do is have an account of the murder scene. And for that, we will go to Matthew chapter 27. A little bit of a long reading. This is uh, verses 33 through 50. And the Bible says this. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled that which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head this accusation written, 
This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyeth the temple and buildeth it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him. With the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for a lass. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be... Let us see whether Elias will come save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And now I will present the evidence against the two main defendants, the Jews and the Romans, as well as a yet unnamed defendant. Now, to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, I will need to find the evidence as well as establish these three factors. Motive, opportunity, and the ability to carry out the crime in question. Now, we'll begin by examining the case against the Jews. I present to you the evidence that they were at the scene of the crime from Matthew chapter 27, 41 through 43 that we read just a minute ago. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved to others, he cannot, he himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And what I want to point out there is that the chief priests were there at the scene. But did they have motive? If anybody had motive for killing Jesus, it was the Jewish leadership. He claimed to be the Messiah. Of course, they didn't believe that. And that to them was blasphemy, a crime punishable by death under Jewish law. He broke their Sabbath day rules by healing people and encouraged others to do as well. Once telling a man that he had just healed to pick up his mat and walk on the Sabbath day. He upset the religious system that they had worked long and hard to twist into their favor and ignored their authority. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus healed a man's withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the Bible records this as their response from Mark chapter 3. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So clearly they had motive, but did they have opportunity? Let's look here in Luke chapter 22, verse 52 through 54. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched out forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then they took him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house. And of course, that is the account of when uh, Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot and, and the, the, the temple's uh, priests and the guards came and captured him. And he pointed out right there to him that he was there all the time and now they had captured him. So yes, yes, they had many opportunities to do the deed. But did they have the ability? Let's look here in Luke chapter four, verse 28. It says, And they in all the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereunto their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. This was just one of the several occasions when they took counsel to, to kill him. 
We'll look in verse 30 what Jesus did. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Until he allowed himself to be captured, Jesus had the ability, it seems, to just leave whenever the Jews got mad enough to hurt him. But beyond that, look at this in John chapter 18. And then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So did they have the ability well, they had the motive, they had the opportunity, but clearly they lacked the ability to kill Jesus on their own. Therefore, we cannot prove them guilty with this evidence. So let's shift our attention to the Romans. Now, this should be a cut and dry case. The evidence is condemning. The cross Jesus was hung on belonged to the Romans. It was a Roman execution being carried out. But were they to blame? Well, let's see. We read this earlier in Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots. They, of course, being the Romans. So, yes, they had opportunity. And then uh, in 27 and verse 38, then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. So if they were crucifying two others at the same time, then clearly, yes, they had the ability to do it. But did they have motive? In Luke chapter 23, verse 20 through 22, Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. Pilate being, of course, the leader of the Roman government in that area. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I found no cause of death in him. So with no motivation to kill Jesus, we must scratch the Romans from our list of suspects. I have one more piece of evidence. A trump card, if you will, which I'm convinced will lead directly to the person or persons responsible for the heinous murder of Jesus Christ. It is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So, if Christ died because of sin, then regardless of motive, opportunity, or the perceived ability, I have but to prove who is this sinner and the killer will be exposed. And that killer is you. Watch this. Romans chapter 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7, 20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. You, my friend, are that sinner. Now, of course, I realize that I just also convicted myself and the Jews and the Romans and every other person that has ever lived as the reason that Christ died on the cross. See, our sins would have condemned us to hell. There had to be a sacrifice to pay the penalty of death. And the only one who qualified was the only one completely innocent. The man, Jesus Christ. Our sins are the reason that he died. I'm sorry, what is that? The bailiff has just told me there's a last minute piece of evidence. He says to look at John chapter 10, 17 through 18. What a coincidence, it's right here. The words of Jesus Christ himself says, Therefore, doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. You know what trumps all the evidence is a confession. No one forced Jesus onto a cross. He went there of his own will. He could have stopped 
at any time. But he loves us so much that he'd rather to die than to lose us forever. He did that so that we could have this. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. You know, a synonym of righteous is innocent. Even though our sins separated us from God, necessitating the death of Jesus, he declares us innocent because he has paid the price. Friends, that's what Christianity, Jesus, the cross, the resurrection, Easter, what it's all about. Jesus paying the penalty for us. There is one caveat to mention, though. It's not automatic. You must decide to place your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, making him the Lord of your life. It's as easy as believing in him and asking him for salvation, committing yourself to serving him. If you have never taken that step, then you are pronounced guilty. I hope you've taken that step of faith. If you have, share your faith with others, especially during this time of so much fear. If you have not, and you'd like to talk more about it, just let me know. Thanks for joining me this evening. God bless.